Okay, um, so I took a look at the schedule and it turned out that uh, before Tuesday's class we were actually ahead of schedule. Now we're on schedule because of uh, the catastrophe that occurred on Tuesday. Uh, we'll call it Black Tuesday or whatever. Um, so based on the fact that now we're back on schedule and I reviewed this homework number 10, it's actually a very light, easy assignment. And so uh, it's not going to be delayed. I had mentioned that because we got pushed back, I would um, be moving the assignment, but I won't. You'll still be able to finish that by Thursday. So uh, what we're going to do today is try and get through all the stuff that we were going to do last time and then um, maybe get a bit further if we can. So let me give you these handouts. All right. So we're going to spend the entire class period going through WMS and um, so start the program and we'll try and pick up where we left off last time which wasn't very far but to their credit I was really uh, pleased with how quickly the Aquaveo people sorted out what they thought the issue was and found some solutions and thank you to all of you who uh, responded to my email that I'd sent out I appreciate it um, that made me feel more confident that we we're going to be able to make some progress today. All right, so um, let's do this. Starting just with the, uh, the computer, just blank. So if you already have something up, you can do new. Uh, just starting with nothing yet going. We'll launch immediately into the hydrologic modeling wizard just to make sure that we can set the projection since that's where we got hung up last time. So that's here, the, the bar across the top that has the uh, wizard hat and a couple of little roller skates I think they look like under there. So click on that and it's going to bring up on the left hand side of that wizard is kind of like a um, an outline of the workflow for executing a hydrologic model. And the first thing it suggests is that you save a project name uh, just in the rare case that the program crashes and you have to reopen it again. So uh, pick a location that you're going to be able to browse to easily. It can be in my documents, it can be a temporary folder, just some place you know. And so I'm going to call this Activity 1 and save it. And you have to click Save underneath the file name for it actually to save something. You notice right now before I click Save across the top it says untitled.wms but then once I click save, it changes it to the file path and the file name that I specified. So at any point, if, if this gets interrupted, I can come back and get to the point where I was when I saved the file. So then on the bottom here, click next, and it'll take you to uh, defining the projection. And you may already have it saying zone, UTM zone 17, if that's what you did to check and make sure the program was operating quickly in the pa correctly in the past. So it might remember the previous projection. But if not, click define. And we're going to be using a global projection. And I never had the problem of the uh, projected coordinate systems. But what they were saying was that if you start to put in some things into the uh, filter strings, then you'll lose the ability because it's actually a search box. So for example, I would want to do UTM and it goes and finds all of the things that have UTM in it. Or if I said like zone 17, then it's going to find all of the projections that have zone 17. So I guess that's helpful. Um, but let me just go from the, uh, the full list of options. It's not the geographic coordinate systems, it's the projected. And what we're looking for, UTM. Not the BLM. We want the UTM, NAD 83 zone 17 north. Okay, and when I click OK, then it'll bring that up in this box. And of course, the uh, alternate approach, if that wasn't working, was you could just choose it out of the library. 
and that's maybe even easier, but um, it's the UTM projection, zone 17, and if you're ever not sure which zone the region is you're working in, it shows the, uh, the coordinates within that range. And so we're in the northern hemisphere, we're between 84 degrees and 78 degrees west, so that's zone 17. And we're going to use NAD 83 as the datum for vertical and meters as the vertical units. Uh, all right, so UTM zone 17, click OK, and for vertical, I want to switch that to meters as well. Now, it doesn't yet define the boundaries of the project because this is two separate things that are happening in this step. The first was we had to tell it the projection, and the projection essentially is telling um, WMS where, uh, where on the map data file should go, like the X and Y coordinates, how does that line up, line up with actual spots in the globe. So the project boundary is going to tell you, is going to tell the computer rather, um, what area of interest should it be using to go and get data. So when you click on define, that's where it brings up this mapping tool where you can search for a place name and we're going to still go with Payden City West Virginia, jump to search location, and it starts off with a street map, which is fine. And I need to zoom out a little bit to uh, follow this Gamble Run Road and Payden Fork. So the intersection of Gamble Run and Payden Fork is what I want to be zoomed in on. Does everybody see the same thing? Anybody need help? We're not good? All right. Man, this is how it should have gone on Tuesday. Just no problems. All right, so we click OK, and what it's going to be doing is it's defining the corners that is the area of interest. And so it's looking at, you know, if I zoomed out, then it would give me different coordinate systems than if I zoom in. And so uh, your view in this virtual Earth map locator is going to define when it goes and gets the soil and the land use and the elevation. So I've already told you previously that this is the watershed we're interested in. And even on just this street map, you can see kind of the ridge lines. Everybody can see these ridge lines, right? So here's the problem. This is a big problem that you need to be sure to avoid. If this was my view, it wouldn't get the whole watershed. It would go and download all of the elevation data that's in this window, but my watershed extends to the north of what's in the window right now. So sometimes this can be an iterative process where you're not exactly sure where the watershed is until you try and delineate it for the first time, but then you see, oh, I wasn't zoomed out far enough, or maybe I needed to pan down a little bit further. So occasionally you'll have to go through this process two or three times before you know exactly what your area of interest is. So you can't just um, know, well, here's the crossing, so I'm going to zoom in on the crossing itself, and that's all I need to know. Your area of interest has to include not only the outlet of the watershed, but the entire extents of the watershed. But then, well, why not just do this and be sure that you're getting everything? Because when you have the area zoomed out that far, it's going to take hours to download all of the elevation and soil type and land use data. So it's kind of uh, a balancing act where you want to be zoomed in enough that it doesn't take forever to download the data and process it because we're going to have it do calculations that where it's looking at every pixel in the elevation map and is doing calculations based on how many pixels there are. So it's computation time and download, download time that we're kind of balancing with the risk of zooming in too close and then not getting the full watershed. All right, so just make sure you've got this watershed in your field of view and when you click OK, then it should enter in these coordinates. Now, sometimes there's this weird bug that sometimes this window just vanishes after what you just did. Did your window vanish? All right, so all you have to do is down here in the system, in the uh, program bar, click it away and back again, and it'll be in front. You already figured that out? Yep. All right. <laughs> Where did it go? Where did it go? You, I don't know why it goes into the background, but it just doesn't always pop up in front. So if you just go like that, it'll be back. All right, so click Next. And now what we're going to use is uh, Web Services to get watershed data. So if you look on the left side in our, our flow of, of the data that it's getting, 
we're going to use web services to go and get this watershed data. Now a thing that I'll mention is that we can interrupt this so you can close this wizard and come back to it at any time. So like you don't lose your spot and you don't have to start over from scratch. So we could still interact with any of these macro buttons across the top and then later on come back to the wizard and we'd be fine. So for instance if I wanted to add the map data which was the first thing I was trying to do so if I clicked get online maps and I've set my location and now it gives me the choice of which maps do I want and I'll take that street map and then when I add street map it adds into the GIS data on the left hand side this world street map and the processing means it's streaming that data to me and so now I've got the map in the background and I could go back to the wizard and where we were at before was watershed data and now I've got that mapping in the background so I can close it and come back to it uh, so let's do that we've added the street map data let's also add the world imagery which is aerial photos that have been stitched together so you click that and you see it's processing again as it kind of downloads that data and it's only downloading as much as in our field of view so if I pan to the side so here I'm going to pan to the side a little bit this new view won't appear until it finishes processing and so it's it's kind of the difference between streaming music and downloading music like when you download an mp3 you no longer need an internet connection you can access that music without constant access to the net here if we pan to the side we have to stream that map data back to us um, and so that's why it's saying processing and then it'll pop up and it's still processing and now it's done so it now has just our current view cached in the background and right now you can see that the one that's on top of the list the imagery data that's all we can see well the the underlying road map is still there if I unclick the world imagery box then that world street map will come in the background again so one of the things that we can do to make it so that every time you pan you're not having to uh, wait for it to catch up is you can save this data it's kind of like downloading an mp3 and so for instance for this world street map if you right click on the word the words world street map then there is export as an option so if you click on export then it gives you some options here now resampling ratio what 2.0 means is it's going to actually download twice as many pixels as you're looking at right now so that means you could zoom in and it would still be clear so that's a nice thing but the the downside of this resampling ratio set to 2 is that then the road names are harder to read and so let me show you what I mean don't don't bother following this yet but I just want to demonstrate if I have my resampling ratio set to 1 what it's downloading is exactly the view that I have right now so I'll click OK and it gives me a, a choice of where to save this so world street map exported you'll notice here it's a TIFF file and it's a geo TIFF so that means that built into the image is a coordinate system that any kind of mapping date any kind of mapping program is going to open this image in the right spot on the globe we did that before in Google Earth Pro we used a geo TIFF so it's going to export and it'll add it as an option here in the GIS data so now we've got the uh, world street map exported and the world street map so I can turn off the world street map and our view isn't going to change but look if I zoom in it starts to get a little bit blurry and so the way around that is let me go back to the world street map and this time downloaded at 2.0 so I'm going to right click export and now the resampling ratio is 2 so it's going to take a little bit longer to download I'm going to call this exported 2 it's working on it once it exports you can see uh, it's automatically loaded it so here's the 2 and so now all of the roads look smaller and the labels are smaller and the reason why is that all of the text has been sized so that it's the appropriate size when you're zoomed in twice as far so you kind of lose a little bit of label clarity 
so it's a little bit of a balancing act to, to use any resampling ratio other than one. So the only reason that we'd want the, uh, the only reason why we'd want the data available is just so that it's easier to, um, it's easier to spot your crossing. All right, so just the one last image file for us to add. Let's do get online maps and do the topographic map. And it'll add that over here to the left. Now, every time we add another image file, it's kind of increasing the amount of RAM that's required. And it can bog the program down. Because anytime you pan, it's going to go and get all of the new imagery for whatever location you are uh, working with. So you, you want to be judicious. You know, the maps are there mostly to help you find road names so that you can uh, find like which particular watershed you want to uh, delineate and where the streams are going to be. Um, but that's how we can add the image data. Um, let's just try and uh, from the street map, so I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to delete the topo map, so right click on it and remove any of these that we don't want to see anymore. I'm going to down I'm going to remove everything except for the world street map. And turn it on. Yes. It won't search it on the All right, so zoom out to the point where you can see these ridge lines again, because what we're going to do is we're going to uh, try and delineate this watershed manually just by drawing a ridge line in. And so um, the mode that we're going to do it in, we're going to use the map module. And so across the top, you'll notice that there's one of these modules, the drainage that looks like a watershed. The map module is the one that has the map symbol, kind of like the uh, compass rose on it. So click on the map module, and then we're going to build a polygon. So we're actually going to uh, draw a, a feature arc. Um, so this create feature arc button, and then trace what looks like the ridge line of that area. And then when you get to the end, double click on the end and it joins together. So what we've basically just drawn is a line. And a polygon is going to be a way for us to uh, tell it it's an enclosed area. So you just were using this create feature arc tool. Now select the feature arc with the, uh, the macro that's above it. So create feature arc. Now what we're doing is selecting it. So you select the feature arc and then right click and build polygon and once it's built the polygon then you can select the polygon and what it what it will tell you over here on the right side is the characteristics and so what we've just 
uh, drawn is a boundary, which is the ridge lines. And encompassed in that boundary is about 119,000 square meters. Did you say build polygon? Mm-hmm. Build polygon, yep. The, uh, the steps are in the handout here. So uh, the first thing that you do is you, uh, you create the feature arc using this button. So that's where we were tracing. And then you have to double click on the same origin to enclose it. So once you've drawn it, then you select it with select feature arc. And so you, cl you click on that line. And then you right click and build polygon. And then once the polygon is built, you select it to be able to look at its properties. The properties that we're interested in is, you know, what's the area of this watershed? So 119,000 square meters. So you know, that's kind of a, a parallel to what we did with Google Earth Pro a couple of days ago when we were just kind of like tracing an area and looking at the, the tools that were available. But we can do better than that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to get some elevation data for this location. And so um, let's start a new project. Do you have a question? Uh, it says I have to install an app to be able to do That's what we're going to do now. Um, let's start from scratch. So click New. We don't want to save the project. Uh, we'll begin the wizard again. So hydrologic modeling wizard, save the project. I'm going to I'm going to just reuse the same name. The project bounds with any luck haven't changed. So we're still zoomed in in about the same spot. And so OK on the project bounds. The boundaries are defined. We still have UTM zone 17. So you click next. Now we're check the box for web services. Rather than loading in all of the uh, GIS data manually, we're just going to use these web services to get. So if you make the box a little bit wider, the one that we want to get is the um, worldwide elevation data, variable resolution. So you click that box and then click download data from web. The zoom level, let's go for the full resolution. Zoom level 15, 3.7 meters. That's going to be maximum accuracy for the elevation data that's available in this location. So click OK. And uh, down here in the bottom, it says that it's downloading the data and then creating a DEM. What we get is a, uh, a contour map. And you can uh, turn on and off this kind of colored representation of the contours. I'll turn those off just because what I want to look at is just the lines themselves. And so it's in the terrain data that that elevation model has been loaded. DEM stands for Digital Elevation Model. And that's what it's just loaded in. And I can add the map same as before. So I can do Get Online Maps and bring up the World Street Map. And it'll put the World Street Map behind that elevation data. And you know it kind of matches up. You'll notice that. It's flat where the road is. The ridge lines seem to match what is indicated on the, uh, the map image file. And it's this watershed that we're interested in delineating. OK, so let me pause for a moment and make sure everybody's in the same spot. You've got the image file up and the elevation data. What did you click to turn on for me? Yeah. Uh, 
So what is the color code on these color contour lines? Red is low elevation. So warmer colors are low elevation. Cooler colors are high elevation. So the blue and green means the ridge line. Um, the spots in red are like streets uh, and creeks. Um, the next thing we're going to do is a program called Topaz. And these contour lines aren't actually what you downloaded. What you downloaded was a bunch of pixels, and the contour lines are generated based on an analysis of the pixels' elevations. And so the digital elevation model, it is like um, each cell, 3.7 meters apart, is uh, a measurement of the elevation. And so, you know, here is a mesh, and it, it looks like a contour map of all these elevation lines, but what it really is, is just, um, it's kind of like a layer underneath the map. And Topaz looks at each cell, and it compares it to the elevation of the cell above, below, and to each side. And it figures out if rain falls onto this location, what direction will that water flow? Will it flow north, south, east, or west? And so um, Topaz does that for every pixel in the digital elevation model and then it builds kind of like a dependency chain where it's going to know um, how much area is upstream of every um, of every cell. Okay, so with that explanation let's take a look at what Topaz actually does. So open back up the hydrologic modeling wizard and go here to compute flow directions and accumulations. Topaz. Um, Let's change the basin areas. It's going to give a report after it runs Topaz. And sometimes if you have a really large watershed, you'll want to see that report in miles. Uh, but if you have a relatively small watershed, uh, it can report it in acres. And it's still working in metric. Like in the background, all of the data it has in, is in metric units. But it can report uh, information in terms of acres for area, feet for length if that's what you're more familiar and if that's maybe what your hydrologic model is, is going to need the data in. Now down here the minimum accumulation threshold any cell that has right now since it says one any cell that has one acre or more of upstream continuing area is going to have, um, be indicated in blue so it's going to find essentially where are all the streams going to form where there's at least one acre of upstream area? So when you click Compute Topaz, if you have a fast processor, it'll just take a second. If you have a slow processor like that Black Friday laptop, it could take maybe a couple of minutes. And then it'll finish with no, uh, normal program termination. And so when you close that, you'll notice now on my screen, it is uh, showing a lot of stream locations. Okay, when did it say that? Okay, so what Topaz does is it uh, puts all of those flow, flow accumulation cells, and look what happens if you change it from one acre to three. So three acres for the minimum threshold and then apply to display. So now what it's doing is it's only showing the cells where there's at least three acres of upstream area, or I could change it to five. And so now it's only going to indicate where would the streams form when you've got five acres of contributing area? So adjusting that can be helpful if you're not seeing the, uh, the stream crossing that you want to see. It's possible that your area is too high. 
Um, if you're seeing nothing but blue and it's just like a mess, then that may mean that your area is too low. Like if I said 0.1 acres, then this becomes kind of a mess. And so that's another thing that you kind of just have to play by feel and, and iterate a little bit. Now, let's zoom in. This was the watershed that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in it because of a hypothetical culvert that's going to go, go in um, underneath Payton Fork Road. So I know there's this watershed and there's a stream that goes under there. And what WMS has done is it's saying that there's likely to be a stream here because this is the lowest point in like this region and there's a lot of upstream area that's contributing to these cells. So what I want to do now is I want to pick an exact point where the culvert's <coughs> going to be. I want to set the watershed outlet and have it automatically delineate the watershed. So if I bring back up the hydrologic modeling wizard, okay, what we did most recently was we computed flow directions and accumulations with topaz. So if you click next, the next thing is to create an outlet point. So when you click create outlet point and then you move your cursor back into this main map window, the next spot you click is going to drop the outlet. Now be very careful because and maybe they fixed it in version 11, but in previous versions it's been hard once you create an outlet to actually delete it and make it go away. It's been the kind of thing where on many occasions I just started from scratch rather than trying to delete the outlet and it just wouldn't go away. So you want to make sure that you are really picking the right spot when you finally click and drop that outlet. So it's the create outlet point and then you're picking where maybe the cell that's just immediately upstream of the roadway crossing that I want to be the outlet of the watershed. And that basically means where is the last point downstream before the water is going to go into the culvert. So is everybody able to uh, drop the outlet? Now at this point we don't really need the mapping data anymore. So you can turn off the mapping data like it's the main purpose of having it there was so that we could find the right crossing and know exactly where to drop the outlet. So I'm just going to turn off this mapping data because it's just slowing me down if it stays. So once you drop the outlet, then you click Next, and uh, we're going to delineate the watershed. So you click this button, Delineate Watershed, <coughs> and it automatically is going to go and follow all of the ridge lines and find the contributing area that feeds into that outlet. So hopefully it'll be in the neighborhood of about 29 acres. Does everybody get about that same thing? Anybody get something radically different than 29 acres? Real small text here, 29 acres. Now another way to get those characteristics, here in the drainage module, if you click on the drainage module, and then you use over here on the left side, uh, select drainage unit or basin. So I, I'm going to select this drainage unit and then I click on it. It'll give me a whole report over here. Uh, so the drainage, the basin area is 29 acres. The average overland flow distance is, uh, frankly I don't know what the units of that would be. The way to know for sure is the uh, the display options over here on the left side of the menu bar. So click display options and under drainage data, right now the only thing that we have shown is the basin area. But we could turn on other things as well like basin slope. Um, maybe we want to know the uh, maximum flow distance. The display options. So let's do basin slope, uh, maximum flow distance. And once you click OK, then it'll add any of those characteristics that you wanted to know. So the basin slope here, our average slope is 28.9 percent in this watershed. So it's steep, but it's not the steepest watershed that we've got here in the state. 
uh, the maximum flow distance. That means that if this is our outlet, the furthest point from that outlet in terms of flow path is uh, 2,343 feet. So we can click, and uh, this is kind of an interesting tool here, this flow path tool. If you click at any spot on the map, it'll show you what path a raindrop will follow to get to the outlet. So that flow path, the maximum flow distance, it's finding everywhere in the watershed what's the furthest distance from This maximum flow distance is just, of all of them, which one's the longest. But like when I click, it's telling you here the overland flow distance before it gets into one of these uh, streams. At the, so this red thing at the bottom, it's telling you how much of it is, it is overland flow and how much of it is stream distance. Now, the stream distance is just based on what we said our upstream area is. So remember, we could control how long this blue line was, right, by saying, one acre versus three acres and so on. So that's kind of an interesting little tool. So we've delineated the watershed. Okay, let's practice in another spot. So let's uh, new, just throw this away. You can save it if you like. I'll save it. Why not? Uh, activity one. And it's, it's always interesting to look at uh, what files get created when you uh, save something. So let's browse to the file save location. In my case, it was uh, C temp. If I can get the file explorer to work. Because it's not just the .wms file that's meaningful. It will save, remember, all of the image files that are in the background. Okay, it was here in this WMS folder that I was uh, saving files. And so I saved activity one. So activity one and it's uh, .wms. And as a default, it seems like uh, Microsoft Windows doesn't know that that's a WMS file for the program WMS. It thinks it's Windows Media Player. So if you actually want to open up that again, you could open it through WMS, but if WMS isn't open, then you'd right click and um, open with dot 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 and uh, the app that we'd want to use. Hopefully we can, well, we'd have to browse to the executable file. And once we do that one time, then it'll know always open files of that type with WMS. Maybe it's just easier to open it directly from the program itself, but you'll see that what it's opened is it had a separate uh, a separate file for this line that we traced. Um, it has some of the image files that I had exported. This .tre is a file that has to do with the streams. So if you ever want to like save your work or share it with someone else, you have to do that same thing where you're archiving the entire folder. You can't just email one of these files and get the, uh, get the project to open. You'd have to save everything and send it to a compressed zip folder, so like a zip archive. All right, but we're going to just get practice by starting from scratch and going to a different location. Uh, this time we're going to work closer to here in Huntington. And so start with the hydrologic modeling wizard. And uh, let's define a new project name, Activity 2. And remember that it's not actually saved here until you click the Save button. Now it's created that. Looks like this computer that I'm working with uh, isn't saving the projection from project to project. Are most of yours, they are saving the projection? Yeah. All right, so that saves you the step that I'm going to have to go through, but it's, I guess, good practice to have it in the recording here. As my recent projections, I'm going to use NAT83 Zone 17 because I'm still 
in uh, Huntington. So click OK. That's still in West Virginia. All of West Virginia is in zone 17. And then I need to also make sure that my vertical datum is set. So the datum is going to be NAVD88 and meters. So all the elevation data I'm going to download is in units of meters. And so I have to tell it that vertically it should be using units of meters. So click OK on that. And then I have to define the boundary. So this time I'm going to zoom to Huntington, West Virginia. jump to that location. So here's Huntington. And uh, it's Darnell Road. And let me show you Darnell Road. The, the view is in the handout. And maybe the best way to find it is to look at the interstate and the shape of the 60, uh, shape of 64. You can see here's Darnell Road. What we're looking for is where Darnell goes under the freeway. And uh, there's a, a stream that goes over, goes under Interstate 64 near Darnell Road. And so it's this stream. You see this stream, it's on our map. And what we want to do is we want to uh, delineate the watershed and find out what's the contributing area that, that is upstream of that crossing. Now, this is a bigger watershed, so it's not as obvious how far to zoom in or how far to zoom out. Um, we may not get the entire watershed. And let's actually do that. Let's zoom in too close and so that you can see what it looks like when you don't have the whole watershed. So zoom into about the same view as I have here. This isn't going to be enough DEM, but I want you to see what that looks like so that you can avoid it in the future. Okay, so click OK and I'm going to have to do this thing where I click to get the uh, the wizard box back. So it's defined the projection and the boundary. I click Next and I'm going to use the web services next to get the elevation data. Later on, we're also going to use the same spot to download soil data and national uh, land cover database, NLCD. We've talked about both of those before. But for now, let's just get the elevation data. So make sure that we've got the right thing, worldwide elevation data, and click download data from web. And let's do it at 15, zoom level 15, the 3.7 meter resolution. Now, if you have the, uh, the higher the zoom level, the more pixels you're going to have for a certain area. So if I used uh, zoom level 12, what that's doing is it's going to get an elevation reading every 30 meters. And so it's kind of like, you know, people are talking about cameras, like is your camera on your phone is it a 10 megapixel camera or a 20 megapixel so the higher number of megapixels the finer the resolution is of the image here the resolution that it's talking about is the size of the pixel so each pixel in the zoom level 15 is 3.7 meters and so it means that the spacing of elevation measurements are 3.7 meters apart so I'm going to click OK and then down here it can say it's downloading it's loading it in and now here's my elevation model and it's created two things it's added the terrain data, which is the important thing. And then it's added this GIS data, which is just a visualization. Um, in case this wasn't obvious enough for you, like where's the low part and where's the high part, this makes it even maybe uh, a little bit more obvious. I'm going to turn off this GIS data because I don't need that elevation tip showing. Um, all right, so let's run Topaz. So go back to the wizard, find compute flow directions and accumulation. So compute topaz, and it's thinking about it, and it terminated. This processor is pretty good. So I'll click close and close, and now it's showing all of the uh, streams. Remember, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the stream that goes under I-64 by Darnell Road. That's going to be hard to find with just this. So I need to uh, load in a map a street map to make sure I get the right spot. So get online maps. Let's load the world street map in the background. You can see as soon as I did that, now the world street map is showing. So here's Darnell Road. Here's Interstate 64. I'm going to zoom in a little bit.
Now, um, sometimes the uh, streams line up exactly with what you're seeing on the image data, and sometimes it doesn't line up exactly because, remember, what WMS is doing is it's finding uh, the low points. And so here, it's thinking that the stream is going to go uh, in that what's actually a roadway. And so here, this is kind of like a plateau where there's not a lot of elevation difference between one spot and the other. And so um, like the accuracy of where a stream is located is a little bit less accurate when you're in a flat area. And so you, you'll notice here there's not a lot of contour lines. There's not sharp relief in the elevation data in this location. And so don't be alarmed by the fact that the stream is a little bit off sideways. Um, this is the stream, that the crossing under Darnell Road that we're interested in. So let's put the outlet just before the interstate, but so that it is including this other branch. So we want to make sure that we get both of these branches coming in together. So I'm going to put the flow accumulation cell after they've joined. Amy? Uh, let's put the outlet. Remember that we already know that we haven't zoomed out for the entire watershed. We just want to look like, see what happens when you don't have the whole watershed. So in the uh, wizard, go to choose outlet locations, create outlet point, and then move the wizard to the side and click a spot where the two streams have merged together and click next and then delineate watershed. Now it's going to take a little bit longer this time for it to delineate the watershed because we've got more elevation points over a wider area. So it'll give you a little report down here at the bottom, the, uh, the progress it's making, computing max flow distance for basin one, and it's taking a long time. If I had used zoom level 14 instead of zoom level 15, this would be going faster because there were fewer pixels if I use zoom level 14. Uh, the accuracy isn't as good, but this is always a trade-off of how much data are you downloading? And how long do each of these steps take? So if I'm working with a really large watershed, like hundreds of miles, hundreds of square miles, then I might use uh, a much lower elevation resolution, like maybe 60 meters or 120 meters. Uh, this is going to be done hopefully soon, 75%. And when it's done, what we're going to find out is that we've got these flat lines. Anytime you see a shape like that, you should be suspicious. Like this is not a natural watershed shape to have just like this flat border. And what it tells you is that's not actually the shape of the watershed, but that's how, that's how zoomed out we were. You know, like these, these were the extents of our view. And so, like I mentioned, it can be an iterative process sometimes picking the right spot. Uh, Amy, in your case, I bet you've got a flat line across the left side as well, which is why you know your streams weren't lining up the same way that ours were. And so, you know, how would you correct if you had this error? That just gives you an idea that all right, I need to zoom out a little bit more. I have to look at it more carefully. And so here, I'm going to use the pan tool to like pan down a little bit and try and see how far do I think that watershed actually goes. It looks like it's going to pick up this ridge line should be in it. And uh, so I may need to zoom out quite a bit further to ensure that I get the entirety of this contributing area. So, I mean, what can you do? Nothing. You just have to trash it all and start from scratch. So click the new button. Don't, don't even bother saving it. So we'll start the, uh, the wizard over again because we need to define new boundaries. So here I was, too, I was focused in too tightly on the crossing location. I need to make sure that I get not only the crossing location, but all of the contributing area. So maybe the view should look more like this, where it's including this uh, Route 10. Okay, I think the view looking like this should catch it all. So click OK. Now we have a different set of coordinates. The projection is the same. Luckily, I remembered it that time. But the coordinates are different. I'm going to use web services. 
let's say I don't want to wait that long. So when I download the data, instead of the uh, zoom level 15, I'm going to go for zoom level 14 this time. And so it, the elevation mesh is going to be more coarse than it was previously. So it'll download faster and it'll do cop topaz faster. It will delineate the watershed faster. So it's downloaded it. It's displaying it. So I'll click close. Back to the wizard. Uh, have it do topaz. All right. Now look at all those streams. Maybe I don't want to see them all with that kind of fine level. So I'm going to change it to five acres of upstream area before it starts showing the blue and apply that so the streams don't reach as far in to the watersheds as they did before. Maybe 10 acres would be enough. All right, now to choose the outlet location, I'm going to have to have some mapping data in the background. So again, I'm going to get online maps and load the World Street map so I can find where is the interstate, where's Darnell Road. All right, so now I'm ready to drop my outlet location. So I go back into the wizard, hydrologic modeling wizard, choose outlet location, and it should be after those two streams have merged together. So just maybe on the uh, eastbound lane of 64. Because all of that water is going to go somewhere, and we're trying to figure out how big would the culvert need to be to carry that flow underneath the roadway. So once you've located the watershed, then you can delineate. Now hopefully we've zoomed out far enough to get this entire watershed. If not, we have to throw everything away, zoom out a little bit further, maybe pan to the side. You'll notice it's, uh, it's maybe going a little bit faster now for computing the maximum flow distance at zoom level 14. I think I've got it. There's no artificially flat areas. Did anybody get more flat areas again? We all zoomed out far enough this time. Okay. Um, make sure that you can see the maximum flow distance, the uh, basin slope, the contributing area. Remember, if you want to see some of the characteristics of the watershed that aren't shown, the way to get those is in the display options and it is the drainage data tab where we could uh, identify the maximum stream length or if we wanted to know the uh, perimeter of is this. It okay if we're off by a little bit? Is that be? Yeah, it's fine because um, Cause like mine's like 11,900 so mm -hmm. Yeah, on a percentage basis that's going to be, what, 1% of the error? And hydrologic models really aren't that accurate to the point where we have to sweat 1% difference in the error. Um, OK. So we're on the back side of this paper if you're following along. If you want to just you know, like write down some of this data in case you wanted to practice again later. Like if we were trying to delineate the watershed area, it looks like it's 12,007 acres is what mine says. The maximum flow distance, uh, MFD, uh, 11,888 feet approximately. The basin slope, BS, uh, 0.24 feet per feet. So that's 0.24 feet of vertical for every foot of horizontal. Okay, the last thing I want to show you before I turn you loose to do some of this on a watershed of your interest. I don't mean turn you loose to leave the room. I mean, like, pick a spot in the state that you're interested in, maybe by your house, by your church, where your grandparents live, whatever, um, and try and delineate a watershed near a place that you're familiar with. But before you do that, I want to show you how to trim a DEM. And so here on the left Project Explorer window, the DEM itself is here under terrain data. So if I turn, if I click that box, then all of the uh, contour lines go away. Um, 
right click on the word activity to or whatever yours is called and trim trim polygon choose a method enter polygon interactively click OK and so now what you can do is you're basically tracing on the outside of where you know the uh, the watershed is and double click and what it does is it kind of tosses away all the rest of the data so now we have two of these there's activity two which was the full DEM map but really what we're what we're focusing on is that trimmed area and the advantage of that is that and you can pan a little bit faster if you save your file then it's going to take up less space and by the way let's save our file save so now you've got a delineated watershed all right so uh, with the rest of our class time which is we've only got about 10 minutes remaining uh, pick a location that you know and delineate the watershed area for that spot and you know you can use the map to help you identify the roads and where the crossing might be the, the crossing of interest How do you complete the, <coughs> the trim yeah. Double -click, you said. yeah I think it's okay. double click For your outlet location, yeah. it has to be right on a stream. It, that outlet should be right, dropped right onto one of those blue flow accumulation cells. Otherwise, when you delineate the watershed, there would just be like essentially no upstream area. So it's a pretty common thing to drop that outlet point in the wrong spot. And uh, you can try selecting and deleting it through the outlet locations dialog box but for whatever reason that's been wildly unsuccessful in the past and you just had to like start the whole project over again if you drop the outlet in the wrong spot
Here's Four Pole Creek. Oftentimes it'll suggest what's appropriate for the, D, uh, the resolution of the DEM file, like based on how big of an area you're zoomed in on. So like I'm doing Four Pole Creek now and it suggested 30 meter resolution based on the size of the area. Okay, I just did Four Pole Creek here. Uh, looks like I missed a little corner down here at the bottom. Not likely to be a lot, a lot but I'd want to uh, revisit that. It has trouble with flat areas. You know, flood zones like Huntington, um, where there's not a lot of elevation relief. I bet the, uh, the hills and hollers outside Point Pleasant it'll work. I mean, there's some stream going through Point Pleasant, right? And you'd be able to delineate the watershed that feeds that stream. OK, so um, when we get together uh, in class on Tuesday, what we're going to do is the same thing. We're going to delineate a watershed, but then we're going to use the data we get to uh, run the rational method. Remember, Q equals CIA. So we're going to start trying to find out what's the flow rate coming out of this watershed according to a couple of different methods. The easiest methods are national stream flow statistics, uh, rational method, a couple of simple approaches before we get into the really sophisticated stuff that allows us, that requires us to calculate the curve number. So that's all I've got for you today. You're welcome to uh, start on the homework. I think you actually could make some progress on that, just loading images and so on. But we'll start getting to the real meat on Tuesday. Same